Here at Vital Work Life, we are a national uh, behavioral health consulting organization, and our promise is to help healthcare organizations address and improve the mental, behavioral, and emotional well-being physicians face every day in their lives and in their practice settings. Um, I had the pleasure of just taking the next five minutes and quickly summarizing the results of our National Physician Stress and Burnout Study. It lays the groundwork for uh, Dr. Sotil's work in just a terrific way uh, with respect to uh, the causation and what physicians around the country um, are, are, are stating they're experiencing and what that experience is like within their organization. Uh, next slide, please. Physician stress and burnout is a critical issue. It's a very critical issue to all of us here at Vital Work Life, so much so that we repeated this national survey that we did back in 2011 and we, with the intent to measure the change in scope of stress and burnout in the U.S. physician population. And there is a spoiler alert. Uh, the results are alarming. You know, um, physicians are in crisis. Uh, in, in fact, in all seriousness, the 2015 study clearly showed not only is it prevalent, but stress and burnout is increasing. And as you can see here, almost 66% of over 2,000 physician respondents indicated more stress and burnout than in our 2011 study. And 88% of the physician respondents identified themselves to moderate, moderately to, the, to severely stressed, with 46% specifying severe stress and burnout. Um, just a quick fun fact. Um, there were uh, 2,005 completed surveys, and it, the demographics of, of this audience largely mirrored uh, the American Medical Association's physician master, fi master file. So it really, in fact, truly represents a 99% confidence level with a plus or minus 3% margin of error. I share that. I've come to learn in my 13 years experience for those that want the metrics, like the data, uh, and, and need that information, um, um, it's there in this survey and something that you can download, by the way, uh, from the hyperlink that's embedded in this uh, PowerPoint presentation, or you can come out to the website, Vital Work Life, and find it there as well. Next slide, please. In all of our national surveys, we include the opportunity for physician uh, respondents to share their insights, and oh boy, do they. Here's just four. Uh, there was 325 comments, uh, which we share in its entirety. Uh, and, and where the data is extremely helpful, it's in these comments that we've come to find that the true nature and extent of the pain physicians are living with uh, is really realized uh, by us in the behavioral health field, and we want to be sure to share that with uh, all of you and with, you know, with healthcare organizations around the country. Uh, these comments have really, we've come to find, really provide a penetrating vision of a physician's inner self, uh, and it really showcases something that's really, in most respects and in most circles, virtually unspoken, but it's their truth spoken in words. So you can see, you know, from uh, you know, the four that I've shared that they're very poignant uh, and, and very uh, to the heart. Uh, and these are the types of, you know, along with the data, it's these kinds of information that, these kinds of comments that come into our experiences you know, and as we work with organizations and physicians in terms of providing appropriately and professional support and coaching. Uh, next slide, please. So real quickly, uh, with respect to the, to the survey, there's three causes, and we looked at it in three different areas. It was external, work-related, and personal uh, life-related factors. And you can see with external factors, a huge portion of the physicians identified the causation related to either healthcare reform or centers for Medica Medicare and Medicaid policies. So another way of saying that is nearly 50% of physician survey respondents indicated that there are, in fact, external factors causing them stress and or burnout in their lives. And this compares to only 13% of respondents who indicated there was nothing in the external environment causing them to be stressed and or burned out. 
when the survey looked at uh, work-related factors, the physician respondents' responses and causes were much more broadly distributed, as you can see from the information um, we're sharing here. The paperwork and administrative demands, too many hours of work, and personal compensation-related factors, you know, are all are all indicating that one out of four physicians are experiencing this around the country. And I think it's worth noting that the fourth top factor that didn't make this list uh, but follows closely at 25% is electronic health and medical records, which probably is no surprise uh, for those that, you know, are participating this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. You know, and the last area when we looked at the cause of stress and burnout for physicians pertained to personal life related factors. And the most dominant factor with 56% in, in general is general concerns about work and life balance. Uh, and it was followed by, as you can see, nearly 50% of physicians indicating not enough time for exercise or wellness activities. And this is compares to only 9.6% of the respondents indicated there was nothing about their personal lives causing them to feel stressed and or burned out. Uh, you know, the, the, the lesson in all of this that we tie at, at, as an organization and, and the consulting we do here at Vital Work Life is to ask and connect the physicians back with their organizations in terms of what kinds of resources and support can they get from their medical staff leadership and from the organization and healthcare um, um, community as a whole, and it doesn't share it here, but I think it's one of uh, the, the, the most eye-opening statistics is that only 18% of the physicians responded that they felt like their organization uh, appropriately provided resource and, resources and services. And, and you can see when, you know, when asked what they're looking for support with, overwhelmingly physicians, you know, want more self-directed time. Overwhelmingly, they want more support with paperwork and charting. And whether it's perceived or whether it's real for the medical staff leadership, it's real for the physicians that they want their organizations to better understand uh, the challenges that they're faced with and provide support and help. Um, it's with that I, I turn I turn it over with pleasure to uh, Vital Work Life um, senior consultant uh, Wayne Sotil, and who's been in the this industry and, and known across the country on a national basis as a subject matter expertise. So Wayne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks for that great information and thanks to all of you busy folks for joining us. Um, this is my favorite topic to address. I have focused on learning from and researching and counseling and coaching and consulting with physicians and medical families and medical organizations for 39 years now in the mission of our uh, career. When I say our, my wife and now both my grown daughters and I do this work together at our Center for Physician Resilience uh, and are excited to partner with Vital Work Life in this mission of promoting uh, resilience, the flip side of burnout um, for physicians and everybody that comes with them, their organizations and their families. Let me begin by uh, defining our terms. By burnout, I specifically mean, and we in the literature mean, uh, in essence, what happens when that certain kind of energy it takes to cope with people in your life diminishes and doesn't rejuvenate with your typical recovery strategies. And you know what I mean, no doubt. You wear on as the week goes on or as the day goes on, too many patients, too many consults, too many interruptions, too many whatever. But then the day ends, you get a good night's sleep, hopefully, wake up the next day or refreshed. Or in your personal life, you're getting on each other's nerves, but you take a break, have a nice connection, have a date, have a conversation, whatever it is, you rejuvenate, your energy cells replenish, you move on. When burnout happens, the rejuvenation strategies stop working and other people become irritants. In my experience, uh, traveling around the country, what physicians today are experiencing is a combination of psychosocial distress. Now, let me add another uh, seminal concept here. When we're talking about burnout and its flip side resilience, we're talking about psychosocial phenomena, and psychosocial phenomena are always multifactorial. 
evidence being, for example, those of you who are, are in love with someone or who are parents. We can at once, there, there are many variables operative. Some contradict but don't cancel each other. You can love the other person tremendously and at the same time be aggravated with them and not want to speak with them for a while. Both those things are true. Well, what we know uh, from our research is indeed, and it's interesting, uh, Mitch, uh, I was involved with Tate Shannerfeld uh, in conducting a, uh, a huge study sponsored by the American Medical Association of uh, physician satisfaction, dissatisfaction, burnout across all specialties. And just as in the vital work-life study, 46% of our respondents were fluidly burned out on measures of burnout, ranging from about 63% of emergency medicine docs down to about one in three dermatologists in preventative medicine and rehab docs. Underlying that burnout are the psychosocial struggles like loneliness and anxiety and wondering what my place is gonna be. But at the same time, a multifactorial reality is most physicians are incredibly resilient. You're able to get through hard times. What we are encouraging and what Vital Work Life is about is helping you get through hard times and come out stronger having gone through those hard times. Why it matters is very, very clear. Lancet called uh, some years ago for uh, putting matters of burnout and wellness of physicians and other providers in a corporate score columns under quality and safety, because we know that as burnout elevates, both in, in studies of, of nurses and in studies of physicians, uh, everything we don't want to happen happens more in medicine, from medical errors to medical malpractice suits. Everything we do want to happen happens less in medicine, patient compliance, patient satisfaction, for example. And from our research, the most powerful predictor of your family being dissatisfied with you, however you define family, will not be how much you work. It'll be your mood when you come home from work. If you start burning out because of mismanagement of your own resilience challenges at work, emotions and attitudes are contagious and you tend to take it home. Now, the flip side of that is also true. What's happening at home tends to affect physicians' attitudes and coping choices at work, and uh, we'll get to that. The flip side of all this is resilience, and this is where the hopeful news comes. Resilience is the ability to get through difficult times and come out stronger having gone through those times, and I'd like for you to listen with ears toward your own resilience, your family's resilience, and your organization's resilience. We can't have resilient physicians unless we, unless we have resilient families and resilient communities, resilient communities in which physicians are living and working. What we know now from great research is that resilience is not a preset or inflexible trait. There is such a thing as some folks being stronger than others, some being more innately hardy than others, more adaptive than others, more optimistic than others, and so forth, those factors that tend to load into resilience. But the, the real news is no matter how resilient you may naturally be, it is an erosionable factor. The flip side of that is that Resilience can also be taught and practiced and developed over time. The target needs to be what's beneath your feet, so to speak, the, your own coping process. One of the challenges I make to the, the organizations I consult with or the, the physicians or medical families that I consult with or we consult with is, listen, you had us at hello. I understand they, whoever they are, they're 90% of the problem. If they would just stop regulating you and messing with you and telling you, uh, messing with your autonomy and, and if they weren't so hard-headed and would just show up and do their work and be cooperative or if they would show up at home and listen to what you, if they would change, it would be better for you. I appreciate that. Here's the resilience challenge. When we finish this conversation, they are still gonna be doing the same stuff they were doing before we started this conversation. So the challenge is, even if they are 90% of the problem, what's the 10% you're willing to own? Think of the analogy, it's as though you're, you're climbing a rock face. And the mistake rock climbers have, have told me 
uh, the mistake to avoid is reaching for something you can't grasp. What's key is to pay attention to what's beneath your feet. The rock climber instructors swear that getting from the ground to three feet up is no more complicated typically than getting three feet further up once you're hundreds of feet off the ground. But the key is to manage the psychological challenge that comes when the drama happens. I'm at this crux. It's the time when psychologically I'm going to decide to continue or fall. And the second key is to not grasp for things you can't reach, waiting for them to change back to reality. Uh, pay attention to what's beneath your feet. Now, specifically, I encourage you to pay attention to what's beneath your feet, so to speak, in terms of the, the, the coping roadmaps you're using to gauge where I am in the journey and what might be the smartest next move in inching my way along this journey. Secondly, to honestly assess yourself, and we'll do a quick self-assessment for psychosocial functioning or distress and uh, burnout. Thirdly, to start building a resilience toolkit that focuses on some of the vital variables 60 plus years of research on resilience, much of it with physicians, um, has suggested to be the key factors in promoting resilience, in determining or differentiating who thrives from who dives as individuals, as families, and as teams. And one of those key factors is countering hassles with uplifts. The other is deepening your relationships. So let's look at roadmaps. What we know is that one of the most crucial questions you could ask and honestly answer to correct your course if you get off course heading in the resilience direction is how happy are you? We used to think happiness was a byproduct of a good life. Uh, if you studied physicians who loved their work and were healthy, they had a, a disproportionate level of happiness compared to those who either didn't like their work or weren't happy. We now know it's a, happiness is a causative agent. The people who truly are able to let go of what otherwise holds other people back um, and thrive are the ones who really bring into their work and in their personal management the stuff it takes to sustain happiness. Happy people make better coping choices is the punchline of that research. It may be that happiness being a positive emotion mitigates the tear, wear and tear effect of negative emotions, but there's no question that happiness is a mediating variable. People who are happy wear their seat belts more. They floss their teeth more frequently. They are more adherent medical patients. They take better care of themselves physically. So physicians who are happier also tend to be healthier. We also know that the happier physicians are the ones that get the best outcomes from patients. In studies where patients are blinded as to whether or not the physician or other provider uh, doing the, the, the uh, ministering to the patient um, are happy, patients deem medical care delivered by a happy physician to be better medical care. And that finding holds up uh, in the face of scrutiny by a panel of peers evaluating the technical proficiency of the doctoring that, that just happened in pill count studies. Uh, prescriptions delivered or advice offered by happy physicians is far more likely to be adhered to by, by uh, the patients because happiness is one of those variables that creates or, you know, or lack of happiness interferes with the primary factor that drives medical adherence in patient populations, that is whether or not I think my provider cares about me. Well, it's tempting to say, okay, let's all just get happy, right? But you can't do that. We've got to build this bridge. And here's where the research writ large suggests we have a matrix of cross-correlating variables worth knowing about when you're gauging where on the journey you are in terms of your own uh, roadmaps. The happiest, most thriving physicians are the ones who also report the highest level of cross-disciplinary collaboration and collegiality. Simply put, physicians who are thriving work in teams that they'd like. Now, the day of the lone wolf is over, and we're, we've got some risk here because we've learned life's about love and work, but sometimes we attempt solutions that perpetuate problems to work-life issues. That one of those being, I don't particularly like uh, my work, so I focus on my personal life. That will only get you through for a while. Unless you also have good engagement at work, 
what will happen is the dissatisfaction at work will bleed into your personal life. It took us decades to figure that out in the trenches of the more than 10,000 physicians and medical families we counseled. We were taught to appreciate you've got to have relative well-being in both arenas. Put another way, working fewer hours in a job you don't like won't solve any of your work-life issues for reasons that will become apparent here in a second. The day of the lone wolf is over. At least the day of the lone resilient wolf is over. We still have some lone burning out wolves. Those who have highest uh, levels of collaboration and collegiality are also the physicians who report the highest levels of career satisfaction. We're to a point of redundancy in this literature. We know what drives career satisfaction for physicians. It's like a four-legged stool. Number one, here's, here's a kind of a, a way of gauging uh, do I have a good job or not, or do I need to rethink something or change something. Number one, can I do work here that matches my values? Number two, can I do that work pretty much to the best of my abilities? Does this group or this organization, this practice, afford me with the tools, the support, the systems, uh, the teams that I need in order to do good work? Number three, to what extent do I enjoy doing the work with the people I'm doing the work with? And number four, to what extent does my family, however you define family, or my support system, not only support, but hopefully applaud and appreciate that work that I'm doing. They pull for me in that work. Now, this is new news about work-life issues. We know that career satisfaction is a primary correlate with your family satisfaction with you, and your family satisfaction with you will be a primary driver of your overall happiness. So those two factors kind of conglomerate. Now, now let me do a, a, a caveat here. I am passionate about being respectful of cultural diversity, um, as I, I know uh, you all are, and, and Vital Work Life certainly is. Um, I am going to refer a bunch to marital research because that's the research that we have the deepest body of data uh, from. Uh, however, mom and daddy raising their biological children applies to a, a minority of, of American households. We've got all kinds of families. We have cohabitating folks. We have folks who are single parent families. We have people who live in different lifestyles. We believe that the lessons learned from this deep and rich uh, research on the most complex psychosocial system we know, long-term marriage, applies to any family form. So for example, what we found in our research uh, this was originally done, uh, we found this in a study of orthopedic surgeons, male orthopedic surgeons and their spouses or life mates who themselves were not orthopedic surgeons. What we found was this, that um, this is one of these multifactorial factors, that burnout didn't correlate very strongly with how much the orthopedic surgeon worked, short of working about 90 hours a week. It's tricky statistics. If you if you if you ask a thousand people who are burned out why they burn out, ninety nine percent tell you because I work too much. If you find out how much they work and in what setting, then go do a larger sample uh, in that setting. You can find for everyone who works that much and burns out, you can find three to five who work that much and more who don't burn out because it's not how much you work; it's about that four legged stool. Match your values. Do the best of your ability, enjoy doing it with the people you're working with, and then do we get support from the people at home. Now, the multifactorialness of this came into play here, that, that um, the orthopedic surgeons started missing their wives, for the most part it was wives. Uh, they started experiencing subjective reports of work-life stress once they worked 65 to 68 hours a week. They missed their spouses at 68 hours a week. The funny thing is that the same measures with the spouses suggested the spouses didn't miss the orthopods till they worked 90 hours a week. And we found this across, across cohorts that we've researched. It's not how much you work, it's your mood when you come home from work that will drive your families or your roommates or your sister across the country when you talk to her about how work is gonna drive your support system's attitudes toward your work, which are going to shape your attitudes toward your work, and you're going to take it into the workplace the next day. So important roadmap. It's 
crucial to have reasonable well-being in your personal life if you want to have reasonable well-being in your professional life, and the new news is vice versa. It's not good enough to just have well-being in one of those places. A, a colleague of ours is, is Chip Campbell, who's the dean of faculty at the University of Michigan, and he has a great quote based on his research of burnout in surgeons, and that is that classical training teaches you how to practice medicine, but then do a great job of teaching you how to live life as a physician. Even in our era of the ADR work week limitations, we're still getting disturbing rates of depression, anxiety, disillusionment, anger, and burnout among medical students and residents. And the newest news flash is how uh, disproportionately frequent suicidal ideation is uh, because it correlates with the burnout in somewhere between 30 and 70 percent of uh, residents and medical students uh, experience burnout. As burnout goes up, so does suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts. The flip side is the good news. As burnout diminishes, both depression and suicidal ideation diminish. We have to have the right roadmap so we can know where to make adjustments. Now, it's not all about medicine. We learned this in the first 15 years of our career that whether you're a physician or not, you face some of the same challenges other people face. And one of those challenges is having an accurate roadmap of what to expect as, you, as you're moving forward in an intimate relationship and having an accurate roadmap to gauge in retrospect, why did we go through what we went through? Pride of survivorship is a characteristic of highly resilient people and teams of all sorts. Thirdly, it's important to have an accurate relationship roadmap so that you can uh, have anticipatory guidance in, in, in knowing what to expect as you move forward. Resilient social systems periodically pause, look back with pride of survivorship on the road they've traveled, sometimes look back lamenting that we went through that hard stuff or that we didn't know then what we know now, but then look forward with joyful anticipation in realistic optimism realistically acknowledging the challenges we face uh, and maintaining a, an attitude of hope as we move forward. So I'll offer this graph uh, either for you to do a retrospective uh, resilience analysis or a contemporary assessment of, oh, that's what's going on with this, or to anticipate what's coming up. On this vertical axis, if we measured anything that, that we want to say as an indicator of intimacy, across time in the relationship, the horizontal axis, you gotta watch out for these trend lines. Now in this vertical axis, we'll measure how often you hold hands, say something nice to your partner, say something nice in front of your partner, in front of other people about your partner. We'll measure the uh, how often you make love. We'll measure the percentage of the last, the percentage of the content of the last conversation you had with your partner you can recall 20 minutes later. We'll measure anything you wanna measure that's an indicator of making nice, of having intimacy. Early in the relationship, it's going to be sky high. Why? Because you're in love. That's why. I'm coming to get you. Problem is, as soon as I get you, there'll be a dip. So, like, that's enough of that now, baby. i got to get back to my real job, whatever that is. You're together somewhere between 5 and 11 years, there'll be a landslide, if you like most people. And what that usually corresponds with just, I think, serendipitously or coincidentally, actually, uh, is having kids. What's interesting is the same dip happens for childless couples because that dip is not primarily about lack of privacy and role strain. It's primarily about disillusionment, feeling double-crossed relative to the pie-in-the-sky notions we had up here when we were first getting together romanticizing everything. Down here, we go from feeling you complete me to you aggravate me half to death. Here's a liberating fact. Happily married people have just as many chronic unresolved issues that they aggravate each other with as do unhappily married people. They, the happily married ones, put it in perspective and don't overcorrect in response to the distress they're feeling. Now, a lot of people bail out at this point, claim, claim they've gotten double cross. Some others believe in uh, living semi-miserably ever after. They give up being nice, give up giving the benefit of the doubt, give up being open-minded and open-hearted. 
give up finding what's right about the other person and live kind of bitterly and uh, forever after. This blue line is the graph that represents what Mary and I always wanted to learn from. Those couples who go through the same kinds of struggles but bounce forward and come out stronger having gone through those struggles. And they're the ones who prove the fact that the resilience journey is a journey. The fact that you're down here, incidentally, I could give you a similar graph if you gave me a little poetic license uh, for what's going to happen with you and your new neighbor that moved in up the street that you think you like or your latest best friend forever you think. They're going to disappoint you too. There are no perfect people, so there are no perfect teams or or at work or at home, and we've got to put our differences in, in perspective. A similar graph, but I would change this bottom to months rather than years, happens in our workplace. You join with great expectation. They're just a matter of months, and you start thinking, whoa, wait, some people around here uh, aren't what I thought they were going to be. And then you're facing a crucial choice given that matrix of cross-correlating variables I showed that suggests reasonable well-being at work and at home or in your personal life and your professional life are very, very uh, intertwined. The choice is going to be, now that I'm disillusioned, what am I going to do? Well, one, I encourage you to contextualize. Of course, we're having some difficulties. Every journey encounters some difficulties. Secondly, believe in resilience. It's not pie in the sky. We know from a, a tremendous study by Galinsky of 10,000 people, prospective five-year study done at the University of Chicago, of everyone at test point one who said they were miserable in their marriage who did not get divorced in the five-year retest period, over 70% at retest said, I'm now happy in my marriage. Um, I'm glad I didn't get divorced. Now, I didn't say 70% said, oh, I'm, already, I'm brain damaged and in love again like we are when we're infatuated. To do that, you got to get a new one every three years and ruin your life, incidentally. This is where the magic zone happens, the realistic level where you respond to the call to character that tough times in relationship uh, present. I am committed. I am going to stay working here. I'm committed. I am going to prove that I'm your friend. I said in sickness and in health, and now that we're going through tough times, I'm going to prove that I will stick with you. That's where pride of survivorship comes from, and that's where we find another one of these multifactorial realities. The happiest couples married more than 35 years say two things. One, they still fight about the same stuff they fought about in the first years of their relationship because – the happiest people have, on average, 12 chronic unresolved issues. However, they got happier because they learned to be more gentle in the ways they dealt with their differences, less inflammatory and incriminating than they were at these less mature stages of the relationship. Now, one of the things to avoid uh, in order to make sure you don't end up on this uh, yellowish line is the myth of the balanced life, believing if I try really, really, really hard, I'm going to be the first person in the history of the human race to have a perfectly balanced life. What this does is set you up to have a life of anxiety, guilt, and anger. No matter where I am and how much I inherently enjoy being there, if I'm anxious or guilty about where I'm not, eventually I get irritated and start manifesting what Mary and I coined years ago the super achiever syndrome. That is, I'm trying so hard to be all things to all people, I end up being this intense person that is not a safe space for anyone. One of our punchlines of our work is that as go your relationships, so will go your resilience. If that's true, then we challenge you to commit to doing what you can do that's beneath your feet, your 10% at least, to be a hero. Heroes are people who create safe spaces for other people. That means several things. One, it means managing your own intensity so that when you show up, what you see looking in their eyes in that microsecond when you walk in and notice that they noticed that was you just walking in, you see looking back a look of relief or joy. My hero, my safe space just walked in, not a look of skitterishness that comes if even with good intentions you pursue this mythical balanced life with such intensity that you show up half burned out if not fully burned out. And what you see looking back is people's look of anxiety about you at your most intense and scary. We also have found 
in terms of accurate roadmaps, that there are special challenges and uh, gifts that come with different structures of physician relationships. The relationship of a male physician and a partner who is not a physician holds some benefit because typically that partner who's not a physician will be the stress absorber. That's shifting in our research. Um, we found that over 60% uh, of spouses of physicians work on average 38 hours a week. And so the cohort of the doctor and his wife in the classical relationship has certainly shifted. These caretakers are living very busy lives, often becoming very type A and driven to the super achiever standpoint of, uh, I've given up my career, but I'm going to raise this family. I'm going to raise it with a vengeance. We work with many medical families that the more driven mate is the non-physician. Uh, a lot to say about each of these. Let me just highlight a few things. The doctor and her husband, when he is not a physician, uh, but she is, is a really challenged cohort because men don't wear the mantle of doctors mate nearly as graciously for nearly as long as do women wear the mantle of doctors mate in our experience, talking about traditional relationships. Our family systems extended family, as well as our communities, don't support the role of doctor's husband nearly as much as we, as a culture, support the role of doctor's wife. And so these men often are a cohort and a growing number of men who 40% of college-educated men make less money than their wives, 28% of women uh, in, in general make more money than their husbands, college-educated or not. Um, this cohort is growing of men being the supportive or trailing spouse and growing without a lot of psychosocial support in our culture. So sometimes in our experience, these husbands of doctors uh, are, are proclaiming just say no to the physician and creating more work-life tensions uh, for women physicians uh, than a lot of male physicians experience. Now, I hasten to add, male physicians, two things have happened in the last 20 years of our career. Uh, women have entered the medical workforce in droves, in the physician cohort, more than 50% of people in medical training are women. But the other thing that's happened is family has entered the hearts of men uh, at all stages of the journey. Men in physician, male physicians now are more struggling with work-life conflict than any prior decade of physicians. Uh, sometimes it manifests that I don't want the life of workaholism that my elders in medicine had. Uh, sometimes it manifests that now that I am an elder in medicine and missed all of my kids' ball games, I don't want to miss all of my grandkids' ball games. So the, the dialogue between medical families needs to be respectful. You know, if I'm at my grandkids' ball games, you're at your kids' ball games, who's going to see the patients? We've got a real big uh, dilemma there, and that's why I think uh, things like concierge services that people like Vital Work Life or Vital Work Life specifically provides with such excellence are really uh, useful solutions to a lot of the dramas that, that uh, medical families face. Finally, the two doctor uh, couples, which is also a growing cohort, have some real advantages of a uh, you know, primary one being an understanding of the angry mistress, in quotes, that medicine often can be, and an understanding of the sacrifices that physicians make, not because they don't love their family, but because medicine often will not come second. So what's important is to rethink this uh, balanced life. And to use accurate roadmaps as you're moving through. And regardless of the structure of your marriage, what's important is put your content in perspective. No matter how much you love each other, you're going to have chronic unresolved issues. What differentiates those families and incidentally work teams that thrive from those that don't are matters of structure and process. Structure has to do with how you allocate your time, for one thing. You want some teamwork at work, you've got to have some meetings. You want some romance in your marriage, you've got to have some dates. That's structure. But structure's not enough. You've also got to show up and behave yourself. That's process. You want some teamwork at work, you've got to have a meeting, but engage in the meeting with an open mind and an open heart. Learn something about other people and contribute something from your own mind and your own heart. Want to have some romance, have a date, but show up with your teeth brushed and your hair combed 
and behave yourself and interact in a way that kicks off byproducts that grow what you want to grow in the relationship garden, uh, increased friendship, increased intimacy. So let's have realistic roadmaps. Second factor is to honestly assess yourself. Beware of that thing you got a PhD in before you got a DO or an MD, and that is the masculine code, the capacity to go numb, keep on going as you move forward, to be competitive, autonomous, invulnerable, and powerful. You do it for too long and then try to self-correct. Actually, physicians do great in recovery. But the mission we have is to get you to intervene earlier in the journey before you get so symptomatic. So here are seven questions that I'm going to ask, and I ask you to real quickly answer yes, no, and keep track of how many yeses you come up with. Okay, just keep track of your yes responses. Number one, during the past month, have you felt burned out from work? Yes or no? Number two, during the past month, have you worried that your work is hardening you emotionally? Number three, have you, in the past month, have you often been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Keep track of your yeses. Number four, during the past month, have you fallen asleep while stopped in traffic or driving? Number five, if any of you are still asleep, wake up. That was a joke. Number five, during the past month, have you felt that all the things you had to do were pulling, were piling up so high that you could not overcome them? Number six, during the past month, have you been bothered by emotional problems such as feeling anxious, depressed, or irritable? And number seven, during the past month, has your physical health interfered with your ability to do your daily work at home or away from home? If you answered four or more, the great folks at Mayo Clinic, uh, Lottie Darby and all, uh, suggest that you're at significant psychosocial distress. It doesn't mean your head's going to fall off, but it means that you're likely approaching, if not on the other side of this kind of peak in uh, pressure performance kind of uh, graph, where you reach a point of diminishing returns, that uh, some pressure is good for getting the edge on and getting focused and having good work, but then beyond that, we start faltering with fatigue and then eventually in the burnout. You know you're burning out if you've got a combination of some combination of these three factors. High emotional exhaustion, you start resenting the routine demands that come with your role. High depersonalization, it's not that you don't care, it's that you're acting as though you don't care. If you were to see a video of you interacting with people at work or at home, that character that looks like you, is so intense, it's, the character is not acting in a way, behaving in a way that matches your heart. They're so busy multitasking, they don't respond to the quiver in the voice or the tear in the eye of the person they're interacting with. And then finally, a diminished sense of personal accomplishment. My family says I work too much. My colleagues say I don't work enough. Nowhere I go do I feel that I've done a good enough job. Now, relative to wellness, and uh, the mission of a vital work life, uh, it's important to notice that both psychosocial and health behaviors aggregate. Just think about it. When you're doing something like exercising, don't you eat a little better, drink a little less, sleep a little bit better? Well, if you take a person who's got a bunch of negative health behaviors, they smoke, they don't exercise, they don't manage their medications, they, so forth. If you can get them to change any one thing, it increases the odds they'll change the others. This is an interesting body of research from Frank et al. that has shown that physicians' own personal health practices correlate with whether or not the physician, both male and female physicians, advise their patients regarding fundamental aspects of health. In other words, if you exercise, you're far more likely to recommend to your patients that they exercise. If you, flip side of this being, if you abuse alcohol, you're less likely to uh, uh, recognize alcohol abuse in your patients and, and so forth. And the list is a long list, including uh, uh, fundamental uh, self-care and um, uh, management of fundamental health problems and preventative practices. So your health behaviors matter, as do your side. And we think the same applies if a physician is anxious, angry, depressed. They're less likely to effectively help patients manage those. The great news is little changes make big differences. Now let's talk about the Resilience Toolkit in addition to all the implications I've already uh, uh, spoken about. 
two crucial factors. One, no matter how many hassles you have, boost the uplifts. Now, Barbara Fredrickson has spent a lifetime uh, documenting in her 40-year prospective studies that a ratio of approximately three uplifts for every hassle protects you from erosion of resilience. Three uplifts. So harvest things, practice noticing for a week, one of these at a time, moments of serenity. I can pause for a second waiting for the elevator rather than fill in this 30 seconds with multitasking. Moments of joy, even if I'm not having a good time, those people are laughing. Let me notice how joyful they seem. Let it sink in. Another one is just your own personal amusement. Families as well as work teams driven by someone who induces some levity into the, the process of the family or the work outperform those driven by a taskmaster who is intimidating hands down in long-term studies. Notice what gives you hope. Notice what gives meaning to your life. Notice what you're proud of uh, through affiliation. Notice and generate acts of love. Notice and generate acts of gratitude. Those are the kinds of uplifts that evidence has shown tremendously boost mood for up to six months. And if you start practicing harvesting one or two or three of those uh, every week or so, you, you will also notice yourself generating them. There's great evidence that just recalling three good things uh, the couple hours before you go to bed at night, and particularly if you journal them or write about them, uh, you don't have to journal tremendously. Just notice three good things and note uh, what they made you feel. Uh, diminished the, and studies done at the Duke uh, Center for Patient Safety and my friend Brian Sexton has shown that it diminishes burnout and increases patient safety for up to six months. It's a tremendous, uh, tr tremendous body of research that's developing there. Finally, I encourage you to deepen your relationships. Now, here I implore you to rethink balance. Good work is good for families. What we know is that, that um, this is from another study of Ellen Galinsky, who ask uh, if you could change anything about your, this is a panel of second through 12th graders who were asked, if you could change anything about the way your mom or dad's work affects your life, what would you change? Now, they brilliantly also asked the parents, what do you predict your kids are going to say? I use this all over the country, and I ask the audiences when I'm lecturing, what do you think your kids would say if I asked? They want more of your what? Most of you just said time. That's what everybody says. Well, Life has a way of humbling us, nothing more than parenting. What Galinsky found is only 10% of the kids wanted more time with mom, only 15% wanted more time with dad. We miss them more than they miss us, sort of like the orthopedic surgeon's wives. And incidentally, we found that with other family structures, also of different physician specialties. What the kids in the Galinsky study said, I, I don't care how much they work, I just wish they were less stressed when they came home. So what we know is that yeah, only 2% of parents get that right. We think in order to be good people, we've got to have that mythical balanced life. What's true is that it's important to get family buy-in for whatever your uh, hard work is and to remember to message in your dialogue that is your family rhetoric pride of affiliation with the kind of family you are. You've got to honor each other's roles, whether you're working outside the home or not. And you've got to fight to keep within family role agreement. Protect relationship rituals is one of the things. Well, let me back up for a second. Well, it, far more important than how much you work is your mood when you come home from work. So rethinking balance to, to view it more as being those four balls of uh, work, family, intimate relationship self, it's, it's more like you're walking across a stream on rocks. Be sure to engage where your foot's going. When you're at work, be at work. Finish well so you can go home and engage at home. Engage well. Don't stay stuck on the addiction of your iPhone or your Crackberry uh, unless you're on call, and that's going to happen too much as it is. You're on a date with your honey pie? Tell the babysitter not to call unless there's a lot of blood and visual tissue damage. You need a relief. And then finally, you're doing self-renewal. Get over your new age guilt. If you're at mosque or in the temple or at church or chanting your mantra or standing on your head or doing yoga or exercising, 
cleanse your head so that you can you can get some rejuvenation and move forward. I encourage you to protect relationship rituals. Elevate to the status of rituals some of the naturally occurring things that happen. I sit down and have a cup of coffee with you in the morning because I love you. Conceptualize it that way. You're going to have the cup of coffee anyway. Make it count as I'm working on I am carpooling these kids. This is a time we can be together and chat if we're not all on our respective devices. Communication is key. It's not everything, but it's, it's necessary, uh, though not sufficient. What we found in our research is that certain kind of communication in medical families is important, and that is the communication where you solicit and divulge your meta comments or your partner's meta comments, M-E-T-A comments, about how are you doing on this journey? What are your reactions to your life experience? We found that non-physician mates don't want to hear all the details of what happens at, at work. Nothing bores non-physicians more than when couples go out to dinner, for example, and the physicians are talking about all the intricate details of medicine. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is discussing the impact your life's journey is having on you. You're staying home. How are you doing with this? Or what's important to you in your we, – we, research in marriage has shown that responses to, to partners' positive experiences are powerfully predictive of marital happiness. And, and, and what dysfunctional couples do is somebody comes home saying, I'm glowing because something great happened to me today, and the other person diminishes the glow either with indifference or an implied criticism or, for God's sake, it's about time kind of comments, as opposed to something important just happened for one of the most important people in my life. Time freezes. I'm going to engage with you and have what's called a constructive, positive response. Tell me what happened. How did you feel about that? Why do you think it happened? Do you think it's going to happen some more? What, you know, I'm so proud of you. Those are the kinds of things. And being solicitous of your partner's kind of meta comments, positive or negative comments or experiences about their role in life is what's important. If you're in a leadership position, I think it's important to commit to uh, given the notion that, that we, uh, to commit to the notion that we need to promote wellness. We've got to work on how we work together. I've been involved for the last two years in a fascinating project at Career and Clinic in Roanoke, Virginia, shaping resilience in neurosurgery residents along with Dr. Gary Simmons. Our model we chose uh, was to train in a combination of emotional intelligence and positive psychology and evidence-based aspects of resilience. Be happy to talk with any of you further about this model. But the point is, if you're a leader, choose a model. Choose a model that does two things, boosts uh, uplifts and counter to the hassles and deepens relationships. This study uh, recently, just this last month, came out of uh, the great Mayo Clinic folks again, Tate Chanerfeld in, in, et al., and found that provider ratings of their leaders accounted for a large percentage of the variance in the burnout of physicians and other scientists and 47% of the variance in satisfaction with the organization, specifically leader behaviors that keep the uh, team informed, engaged, inspired, and help them to develop and be recognized matter. We know from an even broader literature that if you want to shape a happy team and therefore you stay happy, you've got to give some decision-making discretion that boosts control, share information, give feedback, and get rid of the incivil behaviors in your workplace. We think the constant changes and money issues and EMR and so forth create discontent for physicians, but here's the other news here. If 46% of physicians are burned out, that means 54% are not. And I know a bunch of them. Those are the ones who tend to work in settings where there are a lot of conversations about what's going on and people are communicated with and changes messaged and people are dealt with with compassion and there's a generosity of spirit, just like a, a, a marriage that has its own 12 chronic unresolved issues, but they've got more laughter, they've got more thank yous, they've got more what do you think kinds of conversations going on. And then finally, there's a, a lot of effort to do talent and career management. Heroes create safe spaces for other people. What Mitch and I hope is that the comments that, that we have shared with you will help you to uh, recognize the heroism all around you and your patients and their families and your own colleagues, and particularly 
to commit to heroism in managing yourself. That means harvesting the uplifts. That means driving accountability in appropriate ways so that you keep creating safe spaces. Uh, and, and that requires the courage of not just going numb and tolerating uh, the difficulties, but in making some self-corrections. So what's beneath your feet? I hope you protect your happiness. I hope you use realistic roadmaps. Recognize the risks that come with your own commitment, noble as it might be, to being all things to all people or to having that balanced life. I hope you manage your own struggles with change because change is difficulty. And the best way to do that is to counter hassles and uplifts, stay the course of believing in something bigger than yourself. Meaning is an antidote to burnout. Recognize that good work is good for your own resilience, but also for your family's resilience. Do what you've got to do to deepen your relationships. Remember structure and process. Interact with people in a way that kicks off byproducts that kill the weeds in the relationship garden and fertilize the right stuff. Rethink balanced life and commit to heroism. So I thank you all for joining us. We've got a few minutes for questions or comments. Mitch, are you monitoring our group for that? I am, and we did have a couple, and we probably have one, time for just one. Uh, and, Wayne, I think this would be a great one for you. It's it's looking like, you know, someone's approaching uh, physician burnout with the lens of public health um, due to it impacting um, physicians leaving medicine altogether, reducing quality of care, longer wait times. The question is, you know, how do you get your organ, healthcare organization to uh, make this a priority? What are your thoughts about that in all of your years of experience, Wayne? It's a, it's a great question, and um, I do think that uh, we're all sensitive to the fact that this is – I've written about this back 25 years ago. The point of uh, vital work life work and my work is not, oh, we're just going to teach you how to bleed less when cars roll over you. Your job is like standing in the middle of a five – a section uh, intersection and uh now we're going to teach you some techniques to suffer less we've got to change the context and to do that first we need champions of resilience secondly remember w within every organization secondly i find that it's great if you start from the top and cascades down but that seldom happens start somewhere within your own sphere of influence what's beneath your feet Remember that, thirdly, anything measured changes. If you measure it publicly, it changes faster. The best way to measure it publicly, so to speak, is to talk about it. Make matters of wellness or resilience part of your organizational dialogue. So, for example, Carolina's Health System is one of my corporate clients, and they're experimenting in different departments. Every meeting has at least two to five minutes of wellness talk. Now, what that might sound like is, Somebody tell me some new recipe you learned, or somebody do a five-minute yoga thing with us, or somebody tell me what does your Fitbit say because you declared publicly to us that you wanted to exercise more. And it's kind of harvesting the winds. The more we talk about it, the more we drive. Next factor, uh, try to connect the dots uh, uh, between the existing organizational resources. You probably have some resilience-promoting, physician wellness-promoting things going on. Uh, make them easily accessible to physicians and medical families and try to unify them into some kind of one-stop shopping uh, for, the, or for the, the, the medical staff or the members of the medical community. Uh, that's where we can go to get access to resources. My experience is that if physicians create a groundswell of interest in this, administration ends up eventually paying attention. I'm going to tell you, by analogy, that's what's happening. Organizations are finally given spending some of their time, energy, and money providing physicians with uh, scribing services, with help to d deal with electronic medical records. And I think there's an analogy for what we got to do in promoting as a public awareness and organizational awareness what physicians need to promote resilience. Thank you, Wayne. That's probably a great spot to end on. Uh, on behalf of everyone at Vital Work Life, uh, myself, Mitch Best, the CEO, and Wayne Sotil, thank you for participating. Uh, we'd love to hear what you thought about today's presentation. We want to continue to bring you meaningful subject matter. There is the link there here on the uh, to click on to get to the survey. We'll also be sending this to you. Uh, this will be available via on-demand. 
uh, so, so please feel free and share it with your colleagues and friends. Uh, and so have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care.